Welcome to this webinar, a very warm welcome, in fact, from South Africa. And at this event, we're going to look at the role of the media in building trust around evidence-based medicines such as vaccines. My name is Mia Malan, and I'm the editor of the Becky Sisa Center for Health Journalism in Johannesburg, South Africa, and I'll be facilitating today's event. This event is co-hosted by Becky Sisa and the Pulitzer Center in Washington, D.C. Now, our event will be about an hour and 15 minutes long, and we've got three amazing journalists from Kenya, Ghana, and Nigeria who will join our panel later on. But before that, we'll hear from Dr. Ayu Alakija from Nigeria, who is the chair of the African Union's African Vaccine Delivery Alliance. I'm going to introduce our speakers as they speak, but before we start with our discussion, just a few ground rules. So if you have a comment to make or a question to ask, please type it out in the chat box on your Zoom screen. And I'll then either read your comment out aloud or I'll pose your questions to our speakers. And some of you also sent questions when you registered. So I'll be asking a combination of those questions of the ones that we received today and the ones that we've already received. Because Issa will be live tweeting this event from our Twitter handle. And if you'd like to follow those tweets, our handle is at Bekesisa underscore MG. And that handle is also in the chat box on your Zoom screen right now. And if you'd like to live tweet the event yourself, you can use the hashtag health journalism, all one word, of course. And that way we'll easily be able to find your tweet and retweet you from our handle. Or if you'd like to ask a question on Twitter rather than on Zoom, you can use that hashtag health journalism as well and tag at Bekesisa underscore MG. That way we can easily um, pick up your question. Now, if you are a journalist partic participating in today's event, please do stay tuned until the end when Susan Ferris of the Pulitzer Center will tell you more about fellowships at the center that you can apply for that will fund health journalism stories that you can do at your publication. So we're going to start off with Dr. Ayu Alakija because she needs to leave to chair another event today. So we only have her for the first 30 minutes of today's event. After Dr. Alakija's participation, we'll move on to our journalist panel. Now, as I've mentioned, Dr. Alakija is the chair of the African Union's African Vaccine Delivery Alliance, and she's also Nigeria's former chief humanitarian coordinator. Over the past few years, Dr. Alakija has been a leading voice in calling for the reimagining of how the world should respond to the inequities in access to healthcare as exposed by the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Alakija, thanks so much for making the time to join us today. Can you turn on your camera? Thanks so much, Dr. Alakija. I want to ask you to start off by giving us your view on the African media's role in building trust around evidence-based medicines, but also on the challenges that we face around that. Over to you. Can you unmute Dr. Alakija? We're just asking our technical team to unmute you, Dr. Alakija. Fantastic. Just yeah, the technology was not quite technologying um, in that moment. Mia, it is lovely to see you again. Can you hear me? Thank you very much for making the time to join us. Fantastic. It's good to see you all and um, Great to see all the journalist um, colleagues from, from across Africa, Ghana, Nigeria, and Kenya, um, who I managed to see earlier. My apologies, as you've already said, I need to leave early to go and chair um, a board meeting for fine diagnostics. Um, but I'm really pleased to be here, and I really wanted to make time to be here with you today because this is critical, this conversation you're having. It's great to see Pulitzer um, center involved and I'm really pleased also that they're 
that they're sort of, you know, supporting and, and awarding grants to some journalists in this area. I cannot stress just how critical the role of media has been in the COVID the pandemic. And um, I mean, quite frankly, in pushing policy and pushing the dialogue, um, you, 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 had, you introduced me as chair of the Africa Vaccine Delivery Alliance, but also the other role that I wear is as co-chair of the Access to COVID Tools Accelerator and WHO Special Envoy. And it is some of that hat that I will use to speak as well today. Media around the world, globally, I would say that in the, in the, in the fight against COVID in that, you know, trying to get us through this three years of the pandemic, and then I will speak more widely to trust, it is media and the health um, side of the world, health professionals, the health, global health community, Africa's health community that came together to push policymakers to ensure that we didn't all perish in this horrible, in this horrible um, disease that we've just, we've just, we're, we're still living through. So thank you for this opportunity. And it is important that we share experience, expertise, and best practice across Africa. Um, what I would say, first of all, to the media colleagues here is that you must acknowledge and appreciate your power. You have the ability to change policy. You, ability, you have the ability to drive calls for change. You have the ability to build trust. And you all, if you don't, you then have the, what you're doing is helping to reinforce the status quo. I want to call out some colleagues in, in, in the media and some media houses um, globally, you know, Sarah Newey from The Telegraph, I have to mention, you know, as a young woman during the pandemic who, who did some incredible work um, in, in researching, in um, Paul Newkey, in, in um, um, Jennifer Rigby, there were some incredible journalists who caught hold of what was going on three years ago, because I'm using COVID as an example, because it's a once in a hundred year event. So, you know, journalists did an incredible job in South Africa as well um, during COVID, but also you have a experience from HIV AIDS and it's almost building on that sort of advocacy role, that role of holding leaders to account that, that also made South Africa, I would say, come up to the level of the, the Western, Western journalists. So I'm gonna share a little bit of my experiences with media coverage and how reporting and investigative media have helped us support positive health outcomes and build trust. One of the things that I do say is what we have lost greatly in the last three years is trust. Misinformation is rampant on the increase. We're here on Zoom. You know, the other day we all saw a picture of the Pope, you know, the holy drip, as some people called it, you know, the Pope wearing a, a white Balenciaga coat, supposedly that was fake news. That seemed funny at the time, but it's not funny because when it comes to our lives, when it comes to our, 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 our children's lives, when it comes to our health security, as a continent, but Africa's health security is global health security. So it's not just, you know, um, what happens in Africa, it affects the rest of the world. When it comes to that, you, the media, have a critical role to play. And I think we cannot emphasize this enough. So I'm pleased that Susan is here from the Pulitzer Center because I think one of the, one of the things that I advocated for even earlier in the pandemic was that we had more, more dialogue between and more training for journalists on the African continent. What happened in Africa during COVID? What happened in the last three years? Why are we seeing such a reversal in immunizations, not just vaccinations for COVID, but why are we seeing such a huge reversal in immunizations of, 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 of the, the basic things, you know, mumps, rubella, um, the, the basic, basic childhood immunizations, we have rolled back to way, 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 way before, you know, before COVID, because there's a mistrust that has gone on. And I'm going to use again, the fact that Africa has always been leading in terms of vaccine and vaccinations. I don't know, you know, by a show of hands, he, even here on Zoom, if any, all of you can show your hands, those of you who've had to have yellow fever certificates to cross borders, to go from one country to another, you know, if you can all show your hands, you, we, we, we forget that Africa was a leader in vaccinations because in many ways, Africa is the continent that sadly has the greatest burden of infectious disease in the world. You know, and yet when COVID came along, there was this misinformation 
people would say to us, you know, that, 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 that the vaccine that was the, the COVID vaccine was going to cause infertility, the COVID vaccine was going to make children, um, make children die, the COVID vaccine was going to cause women to lose pregnant women to lose their babies. And this is the wave of misinformation and distrust feeding itself across the world. But before that, before we even got to the vaccinations, I will speak to what happened when COVID first hit. We in Africa, said that COVID did not exist. We said that COVID did not exist because we were not seeing the impact. We were feeding our news from the northern hemisphere, from the sort of global north. We were feeding our news from the fact that, oh, well, older people are dying. We saw the images, which again, the media did an incredible job of capturing the images in New York City. You will all remember those vivid images of the of the, the, the refrigerated trucks that were carrying bodies. It was ditto for Italy and Brazil and even India when they had the Delta wave. What was the difference between them and us? This is what you as media colleagues needed and need to begin to interrogate. What was the difference? The difference was they had health systems that we didn't have. So it's, it, it was wrong and it would be wrong for us to copy and paste those stories into our own um, realities on the ground. We saw pictures also from South Africa. Why did we see pictures from South Africa and video and images from South Africa, but we didn't see them from Nigeria? Simple, the health systems that exist in South Africa, that exist in, in, um, in Brazil, that exist in Italy, that exist in New York, do not exist in many parts of Africa. We do not have the same systems. We do not have... He's muted. We do not have the same levels of infrastructure. Therefore, we need to report in a different manner. Our investigations and our journalism needs to reflect, it needs to be contextualized to what is going on within our own settings. And that for me was the biggest difference because the mistrust that was caused in Africa, even with policymakers, you know, I would speak to heads of state, I would speak to leaders who would say, well, it's not the same thing. So now we fast forward three years, we fast forward to where we have long COVID. We fast forward to where something that people like me have feared for the last three years, which is the fact that those who said that only older people were dying of COVID have now are now beginning to realize that COVID was somewhere in terms of its effects on our immune system, somewhere between the, 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 the common cold and HIV. We don't know what it's going to do to the immune system. It is not for another five years, I said at the very beginning, that what COVID is doing today, we will not know for another five years. Just like with HIV, it presented as a simple flu-like illness. And it wasn't until five, 10 years later that people began to see the full effects. And in those, at that, that time, people like me who are, who are scientists and who are public health professionals argued. We argued that, you know, Africa has a young population. If long COVID hits or if there are longer term effects and we are not dealing with it now, then the problem will be that our economically active population will be affected. They'll be very severely affected in five to 10 years time. So COVID not just being a health disease, but being a, a crisis, but also being an economic crisis, being, a, being a, a gender crisis, being an education crisis will crash on our shores much further, the effects of, will crash on our shores much further than the, the rest of the world because we're not seeing the acute effects. Why am I saying this to journalists? Because it is your role to help us to unearth that. It is your role as African journalists to contextualize it, to contextualize it to, to our situation. So I've given you some examples of Sarah Newey and, and some other journalists, you know, journalists from, 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 from across the board, from the US, from the UK, who burnt my phone up during COVID. So what are my lessons to you, my, my brothers and sisters in Africa, is that reach out, find those within the health community that you can, you can reach out to and be persistent because some of what we also saw from some of our countries, and we all know that in many countries, you know, you have to, to some extent, need to play the, 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 the drum. You have to dance to the drum of the government. But media is meant to be independent. And in a health situation, you cannot take the government's line and, 
and, and, and, and report that as it is, because it is the media that shifted the UK government's stance on, on, on many of the issues around COVID. It is the media that shifted the US's stance. Without the media, we would not have had vaccines and, therapy, and, 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 and diagnostics in Africa, because it was media colleagues from the global north who pushed who pushed actively and said, no, we must not allow Africa and the rest of the global South to be left behind. I will give one example of an interview that I gave to the BBC late in 20, I believe it was 2020, or oh, I can't remember, it was 2021, November is 2021, at a time which, again, media colleagues had helped me to understand that what was going on was that the whole of Africa was about to be banned from traveling. Like I said, that had COVID started in Africa, that world would have locked us away and thrown away the key. And in that interview, I spoke very strongly to power. I spoke very strongly to what was going on with the global, with the global North versus the global South about the fact that Africa was being discriminated against. That interview shifted policy. It shifted policy because the media picked it up. It shifted policy because people began to investigate. When we spoke about vaccine equity, the media were the ones who carried the story that shifted policy and ensured that, you know, now we are beginning to speak longer term. Forget just getting COVID vaccines into Africa. I don't want to get into that argument. But now we're beginning to look at developing our own health security. We're beginning to see an Africa that will be able to stand on her own because we're talking about regional manufacturing. It was the media that did that. It was the media and the global health community that did that in partnership together, shifting policy. So my key messages to you would be to always seek to critique a situation, cross-reference your sources. You know, there were some times in Nigeria, I was incredibly frustrated because you would be told that there was one case of COVID in the whole of Nigeria in over, over a two day reporting period. Give me a break. Come on, you know, I mean, of course that was not the case, you know, so it, we need to, when other countries try to do that, media, went, went and, and, and sat on them and ensured that the government were held to account. So critique, you're the ones who hold the accountability card, hold a mirror up for, the, for, 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 for us, the global health community, as well as for governments, as well as for those who affect who we are as, and, 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 and our health you know, as people. It's not just in terms of vaccines that have now become slightly controversial, but it is a wider, wider health security agenda. If we don't improve the maternal mortality and child mortality statistics in Africa, if we don't improve our, our education statistics in Africa, it is the media who are able to hold up that mirror. You know, we talk, we, we're beginning to talk a lot about reflexivity. You know, we need ourselves as Africans to look at who we are. What are we doing before we, you know, we point one finger to the world, four, four ping, fingers point back to yourself. So we need to look at ourselves and say, what are we doing? A lot of the work that has been done in the last three years, calling for, 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 for the world to listen more to Africa, for the world to, to involve Africa more, has come from the outside. So I'm pleased to see colleagues here from Africa today, because it is time for you to bring the voice to the world. It is time for you to tell the stories. Until the lion learns to write, the story will always remain the story of the hunter. You know, I, again, I say often and often in Yoruba, which is my language, it is a person who wears the shoe who understands where, the, where it is hurting the feet. So it is Taiwo who can bring stories to us directly from the villages of, 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 of where vaccines are not getting to or health systems are not not strong enough to withstand whatever health threats. It is real one. It is, it, it, it is you who are out there who are able to truly tell the world as opposed to those stories being third and fourth hand. I also call to you know, people like Pulitzer who are doing an incredible job with this and others to fund the work that you do so that you don't have to rely on government sources, so that you don't have to rely on, on government handouts or being compromised in, in, in how you report your stories so that journalism for health as it is for politics can be truly independent. Be proactive and remember your power. Remember your power. 
the power of media in the last three years has saved millions of lives. I cannot, I cannot commend enough my colleagues in the media. I mean, I had people like Christian Amampo and her team who were on my phone on a weekly basis, reaching out, learning, learning the lingo, learning the terminology, asking the deep questions, then going away and researching. I had teams from the BBC come to my house in Abuja to come and learn for hours exactly how it is that we're being affected. I say to you, my African brothers and sisters, that it is time for you to recognize your own power and have an awakening. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Alekija, for sharing your really insightful views. I specifically like that you emphasize that we as the media, if we do it right, can really influence or inform policy. And also that you pointed out that pandemics are a little bit like mirrors of society, that they showed us what's the difference between the health systems and realities in Africa and in the Western world, and that we also need to adjust our um, reporting then to reflect that. I would like to invite everyone who is on this webinar to, um, if you have questions to Dr. Alekija, we have about 15 minutes, um, perhaps just a little bit less than that, to pose your questions to her, and she would be very happy to respond to it. Dr. Alekija, I want to start off with one of the questions we received from someone who registered, who is Stephanie Burton, who is a professor at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. And she wants to know how effective have scientists been in conveying information to journalists and to governments when it comes to pandemics or other evidence-based um, medicines, for instance, what measures to take up to fight a pandemic. Do you think they are effective? Do scientists speak in the kind of language um, that media needs to understand and are they accessible enough? Please unmute her. Thank you. Um, thanks, Mia. That's a great question. And that has been, I think, one of the fascinating things that we have seen um, within the last three years. I mean, for me, I think one of my, my what I've seen my role as as somebody who, who's a global health um, expert is to speak in language that people understand. And I think we have understood in the last few years that when you speak highfalutin scientific language, even in journals, it is difficult for the, for, for, for the common man to understand. It's also difficult for the media to understand because I think we all have a role to play in this translating role. We are translators. My role I see as a translator to take the science and to take the, 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 the the, the lingo and to make it something that everybody on the street can understand, to be able to present at the WHO, but also to be able to distill what comes from the WHO to, to, to say Taiwo or to say um, um, Ridwan or, 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 or to you, Mia, and to help you to understand how it affects our lives. So I think that there has been a disconnect and I think the way that scientific publications and scientific writing is almost quite snooty. And so it's, 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 I mean, even for me, sometimes it's like, what is this double Dutch Greek? I mean, why is it so complicated? You know, why is it not? Because it's health after all, people should be able to understand it. I think COVID is beginning to show, is beginning to break that down. You know, the, the, the language, but I, I think we haven't done a good enough job. The language around vaccinations, for instance, that even the language, is the, the language that we use around, I would say something like diagnostics. What does diagnostics mean? You know, it means testing. It means how do we test people? The, the fact that we didn't do enough testing in Africa is the reason why the Omicron variant was first discovered in Africa. But why were we not testing enough people? Number one, because the cost was too high. Number two, because we didn't prioritize it enough. We didn't prioritize it enough because the language around PCR testing at the very beginning, it wasn't right down at the community level. We didn't distill it down to the level that people can understand. You know, So we, we ourselves as scientists have to do a better job. And, and, and I think we have to work closer with media 
You know, one of the scientists that I really admire, you know, the work that has been done by um, Maria Van Kerkhove, for instance, um, at WHO, Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove, and, and actually Dr. Mike Ryan, who started TikToks and, 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 um, and, um, um, community sort of like they, they would do, I forget what those things are called. You know, they would do one of those fancy things that you do on social media to get the message out to the people. The weekly messages that were coming out from from, from place like WHO or w, WH um, Afro or, 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 or WHO Dr. Tedros himself every week, answering questions with media. And again, I'm gonna challenge African media that we didn't see enough of you at those press conferences. We didn't see enough of you tapping into that. Thanks, Dr. Alekija. We have another question from Catherine Cleary, who is from the media development organization Internet Network. And she asks, what advice do you have for journalists who are struggling to still tell the COVID-19 or vaccine story in a way that continues to make it relevant to their audiences today? That is a great question. Um, again, you know, I said earlier, of course, this is Africa focused, so I'm, I'm, I'm turning it towards Africa. I said earlier that what we did as a global community was we followed the direction, we followed the lead of the global north. We followed the lead of the US, the UK, in, even in their reporting of numbers. And so COVID then became a disease that was over there. So when they had vaccinated their populations, as they still are, you know, there's guidance that came out just yesterday asking for the whole world to continue to boost for those who are at risk, you know, every um, which is really in Africa, most people who have high blood pressure, which is 30 year olds, and also health workers, etc. Um, when they decided, when the West was able to open up their stadiums and started having football matches and started going to concerts, we in Africa, because we were following their lead, forgot that we are the least vaccinated continent in the world. We forgot that our own back people were not vaccinated. And so we stopped talking about vaccinations because it was late. Even for the global north, I think, you know, and I don't know where, where, where the lady who, who asked that question is based. I think we have to continue to tell it in the context of long COVID. We have to continue to tell the story in the context of COVID was not just an acute illness. We are learning about it every day, that long COVID is damaging lives. Long, there are people, children with long COVID who used, or people who used to be marathon run, runners who are unable now to walk more than a hundred meters. We have to tell the story in, you know, what has happened has been politics, right? And this is where the role of the media is critical. Political leaders, I mean, there was bad leadership in the world at the beginning of COVID. We had Donald Trump who was denying it. We had Boris Johnson who was, who, 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 who everybody was more focused on the, on the, um, their political and their nationalistic view than the global health threat. And this is a challenge for you as journalists. The journalists have to be that bridge between the science and between the people. You have to give the people the full and correct information because the US is one of the greatest deniers of, of COVID because of their leadership. And so they're also not very vaccinated and that story needs to continue to be told. So you need to follow the science. I would ask everybody to follow, follow long COVID at the moment and go and see what COVID is continuing to do, what repeated infections it's continuing to do to people's lives. That is the way to ensure that people, you know, I mean, in Africa, some people have only had one or two vaccinations. I would almost wanna ask a show of hand who has, who has been vaccinated on, or fully vaccinated on this, on this, um, on this call, we need to look at the long-term effects, and we need to understand that COVID is not over. We need to ensure that we're telling people to continue to take precautions when you're in crowded environments. People don't just drop dead and die. You know, I tell everyone that my husband lost so many of his friends. I'm going to give an example in Unilag, University of Lagos, about two years ago. About five university professors in their 70s, late 60s, 70s died in a one week period. That was a story that Africa should have picked up and run with. That would have helped Africans to understand that this is a, is a, a disease that is, is killing our, 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 basically our intellectual capital, but also is a disease that we need to protect against. 
Thanks very much for that advice, Dr. Olakija, especially about long COVID, that that's an issue that we really need to focus on now. Before you go, moving on to the last issue, which I know you're very passionate about, there is a comment from Catherine who's pointing out that in order for us, to us journalists to be able to report well on these issues, we need access to information. And a lot of these, um, this type of access to information happens at conferences. And she says this is why it's so critical that we have huge conferences like the World Conference on Science Journalists and, for instance, also AIDS conferences. Yet we are seeing colleagues from the global south that face ongoing barriers to accessing these resources because of visas. So there's a structural issue, issue when it comes to access to information at many of these international events. What's the solution around that? Look, there's a structural issue in the whole world. I mean, the whole global system in, in itself is, is, is fractured in so many ways. And I've said this before, you know, that, that we look at a world where, you know, I was recently in India for the G20 meeting and, and of, 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 you know, the foreign ministers meeting and the Racina dialogue. And at that, at that convening, I told them that, you know, when we're dealing in a world that is it, it with global structures, the multilateral global structure that was created post 1948, the Bretton Woods institutions that sort of lead us and guide us were created 1948 in the image and in the likeness of those they were meant to fix. They were they were created to fix Europe after the Second World War, and that was the right thing to do at the time. However, the mo major so that was the problematic area of the world. That was a problem child in, at that moment, and therefore those institutions look they were created in the image and the likeness they look like those they were created to fix they are led by those they were created to fix they were not south facing they were not facing africa or asia now the problems of the world have shifted axis africa asia many other latin america other parts of the world had the highest burden of the d disease had the highest levels of of of, of unemployment and poverty had the highest level of education i will also say that we have to again look take a mirror and look at ourselves and say that what is wrong with our leadership and what is wrong with our governance that that that, that that is the case, but that's a whole nother seminar and we can do that another day. But back to the institutions and the world, we now need a shift in the multilateral system of the world. We need to recalibrate. Power must change hands in the world so that these, the, these, these um, institutions and the World Institute of Journalists or whatever the world body is, begin to recognize that they cannot shave our heads in our absence. I say this all the time. It's something my mother used to say, you have to have these meetings where we are. We have to convene them, but also we as Africa need to look at ourselves. It is difficult for Africans to get to South Africa. It is difficult for Africans to get to Brazil. The global South also needs to look at what our own biases are against ourselves because united we stand, divided we fall. We as a global South must, must begin to look at South-South platforms. If the global North will not allow us into Canada for an AIDS conference, then don't go to the AIDS conference in Canada. Have your own AIDS conference at home and ask them to come. If they won't allow you to go to Australia, then you boycott it. Because most of these meetings, they're talking about us. They're talking about our problems. Again, they're shaving our heads in our absence. And we have to say enough is enough. Global South-South collaboration and South-South platforms are absolutely the way to go. You, the media, are the key to that. Because if you keep shouting, if you keep putting it in your news articles, you keep putting it out on television, then the world will shift and understand that the, until the global South builds and, 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 and is, is standing together with the rest of the world, the global North, the global South flames both a, a light flying, flying together, then we will have a world that has health security. Then we will have a world that can meet the global goals, the SDGs. But as we are at the moment, it's not going to happen. But your role as media is critical. Dr. Alekija, we know you need to go. There are a few more questions, but I know your time is up. I really want to thank you for making the time for us today. We really appreciate your insights. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It's lovely to see you again, Mia. You stay in touch and bye to all of you. And, and, and I wish you a happy deliberations and conversation. Take care. Sorry, I have to go. Thanks so much. And we're now going to move on to our journalist panel.
Um, can all the panelists please turn on their cameras? The three panelists. I'm going to start to introduce them so long. So Angela Okech is from Kenya, and she's a senior health reporter and acting vaccine editor at the Nation Media Group's print newspaper, The Daily Nation. Angela has been named the best health print reporter in Kenya for four consecutive years. We also have Ridwan Karim Dini Osmanis. He is a broadcast journalist and news presenter from Ghana. He's also a grantee of the Pulitzer Center and a 2023 Atlantic Fellow for Health Equity at the George Washington University. And our third panelist is Taiwo Adabulu, who is the founding editor of the Fact Checking Desk at The Cable, which is a Nigerian independent digital newspaper. He's also the newspaper's features and investigations editor. He won the overall prize at the African Fact Checking Awards in 2020, and he is also a Pulitzer grantee. Thanks very much for your time to all three of you to join us today. I want to start off by asking you, you've all reported widely on the COVID-19 pandemic. And I wonder if each of you could start off just for five minutes, each of you, with sharing an example of a story that you did during the pandemic that built trust in science and also tell us then what the impact of your story was. Angela, we could start off with you. We need to unmute Angela. Hi, Angela. Hi, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon. Um, my name is Angela Okech, as you've heard the, the, uh, the Mia said. Uh, I've reported COVID since it uh, was first reported in the country. And uh, just to give an overview of a story that I did that uh, Mia has just said, I did a story about uh, how safe it is for uh, expectant women to get vaccinated uh, using the COVID-19. Initially, uh, when COVID struck in the country, there were uh, quite a number of issues. And uh, as Dr. Alikija said, there were quite a number of issues uh, when they were talking about the COVID-19 vaccine and how it's going to cause infertility, how it's going to cause women, uh, expectant women to lose their babies and in, they will die in the process if they get the COVID-19 vaccine. But then there were quite a number of journals that were written. There were quite a number of peer-reviewed papers that, were, that had been written on this uh, uh, particular subject. But then in the country, uh, women were shying away from getting the vaccine. And uh, the reason as to why is because of the myths and misconceptions that have been uh, so many about it. But then uh, secondly, what was the need for me to do this story? I That's a myth. That we were, these women, they were losing out, or they were not uh, being considered as one of the uh, risky, uh, one of the risky uh, population that could that needed the vaccine. So uh, the first thing that I did, I I got uh, quite a number of journals in regards to the subject. Uh, I, I I reviewed quite a number of articles that were written and. Uh, funnily enough, most of the countries were giving uh, their expectant women these vaccines, but in the continent Africa, uh, most of the countries were shying away from having their expectant women uh, get vaccinated. So my, my, my story really needed to answer the question, why are we being left behind? And so using uh, data and journals from that had been written before, so I had to, and one of the things that I did the journals are not uh, like uh, Kenyan based or other African based, they are journals from other countries. And how do we bring it in the country so that these women could understand and know very well that this vaccine was safe for them to take it. So one of the aspects that really uh, I had to do, rather I had to ensure that I have it in my story is bringing the local experts into this story. How do we bring like many of the women, they really believe that when my doctor says that it's safe for me to get this vaccine, why not? 
So I had to look for uh, local experts in, uh, in as much as I'm telling a story from a journal that has been done in the other country. What is my doctor in Kenya saying about the vaccine? So I had to bring in the local experts, uh, the local, uh, the so-called the gynecologists in the country. What are they saying about this particular vaccine? And what do they have to, what trust? Uh, if the women trust the doctors, are they really going to have this vaccine? So I had to bring in the local experts, mm. tell them that uh, for them to convince the women that indeed this vaccine, it's, uh, it's safe. So after the vaccine, after, sorry, after the story was published with their expert voices, the doctors who attend to them, I got so quite a number of emails from the women. Angela, is it really safe for me to have the vaccine? But if my doctor so and so say so, then I will have the vaccine. Then something else that also came up is, uh, is the vaccine safe in the first trimester, in the second trimester, or in the third trimester? I had to go back to the doctors. Now we've convinced the women that this vaccine is very safe. So how do we like bring everyone because there are quite a number of women in the first, second, and third trimester. How do we bring them on board to ensure that we we uh, we we have their trust in vaccine and also to ensure that uh, they are more convinced that there's nothing that is going to happen to their babies after they've taken the vaccine. So I had to do a follow up story after the first story that this vaccine is now safe for you to take, but at what point do you need to take the vaccine if you are expectant? Uh, from the local voices, the vaccine was safe in every uh, in every step, regardless of whether you are first, second, or the third trimester. But that also brought in another trust from the women, and you could see that most women, regardless of their of their uh, trimester or month of their expectancy, they were getting the vaccine at that particular point. What impact did the story have after? Uh, what big impact it had after the story was published. You find that the number of women who are getting this vaccine, the expectant women, increased uh, uh, after the story ran. But then an, another example is that after the increase in the number of uh, expectant uh, women getting the vaccine, as a journalist, what is my, uh, what is my uh, position? As uh, Dr. Alikija said, I'd say, it is time for us to bring the voices to the world and make noise about it. How frequently do you do this story? Because it's not a one-off thing. After telling the story of the safety of vaccine in women, do I have to do it on, in, uh, for instance, if I did it in January, do I have to keep quiet until uh, December? What other, uh, uh, what we call the what other journals are being reviewed about this particular area? What is the other articles that are being done in this particular? You have to keep on doing these stories to also gain their trust. You have to like do the stories frequently, oftenly, so that when you have this story subject this uh, like let's say this month, you don't have to wait to because there are quite a number of women who are getting expectant and we still have this vaccine or rather COVID, the virus with us here. How do we bring in, um, how do we continue the conversation so that others who are coming in, they keep on reading the safety of this uh, particular vaccine because they want to have it at the same time. And then also something that came up that I thought was very important when I'm telling this kind of stories, what does it take? What is the process of having a vaccine? Uh, for them to gain the trust. It's not something that would happen in a night. Then we have the, the vaccine in the next, uh, for, for instance, if I have, it will not take like days for us to have a vaccine. There's a process. So how do you convince them that this is something that even the safety effectiveness had been like uh, looked into? Uh, so that also I thought was something that we can uh, leverage on as a journalist. The process uh, of having the vaccine, uh, it takes like a while for a vaccine to be developed. So at what given point do you have, uh, to, do you have to say that we have a vaccine? It takes time. So all that you have to put in mind for you to uh, get the trust of people who are using the vaccines or rather the medicine. Uh, something Thanks that's very much. Up. Angela, I'm going to ask you just, just hold that thought there because I do want to allow for time for the Q&A as well. 
But I think you taught us a few very important lessons here. The first one I picked up is that the messenger matters. Who says something matters and it has to be someone that your readers or that community that you're focusing on trusts. So that we also we need to find local experts, just like Dr. Alakitra said, it doesn't help to take a global north, north person to comment on a pandemic in the global south. We need to make it relevant. And the way in which you followed up again on the story, I think is a great lesson that we shouldn't just do a story, leave and there the people go that it is great value and going back and following up so thank you very very much for that and also pointing out that we need to break down the science for instance like vaccines so that people can understand what this evidence-based measure is that that um, they could take for help Ridwan, can we move on to you and can you please share one of your examples that yes. you have, um, I know you're a broadcast journalist, stories that you, a story that you have produced that and how did you do it and what was the impact? Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. I'm going to make this very short, but first and foremost, I would want to say a very big thank you to the Polizza Center because without the Polizza Center um, sponsoring some of the stories that we are doing, I mean, some of the issues we are hearing about vaccine hesitancy, historic I mean, traumas, you know, and, you know, the low vaccination rates would never be heard of because in our newsrooms, those are not the stories that the managers would want to put their money to, you know, and across many African newsrooms, that's what is happening. So it's a great job that they are doing. And my challenge now is for them is, is for them to incorporate some bit of, you know, training and I'm not talking about online training, maybe in-person training, you know, to help build the capacity of, of, of African journalists, because some of us have been reporting for the longest time, but we don't even know where some of these big pharmaceutical companies are and, and how they operate. I, I think it will be a great exposure that will help improve our reporting. My latest work focused on vaccination rates in West Africa, focusing largely on Ghana and Sierra Leone. And the report was to establish why the vaccination rates are low. And my reporting established that the vaccination rates were low because a lot of the countries have eased the restrictions. And so people didn't see the need, you know, to go get, you know, the jab. And so we are looking at low and no risk perceptions generally among the public. Another thing that the reporting established was also that the communication has been one way. So uh, you have a, uh, somebody from the health ministry um, go on radio and say that, you know, if you don't take the vaccine, you will die. If you don't take the vaccine, this will happen to you. So go and get the job. And so the people in the villages, the people in the local communities who have questions, don't have the opportunity to ask those questions. And so the communication was one way. And so you realize that a two-way communication was what was needed to actually get you know, people to ask questions and be able to accept the vaccines. And I, I followed a team to a community that nobody, for instance, has taken the vaccine. And we got there and they tried the two-way communication with this gentleman. They spent some time, the guy had a barrage of questions and they spent a lot of time, you know, responding to the questions. And eventually the guy was the first guy in the community to take the vaccine. Then after that, you realize that a lot of the mem a lot of the community members, you know, started coming out and saying that, okay, if somebody has taken it and we are seeing that the person is alive, then I will take it as well. So, what I have seen is, is the way we generally approach risk communication in Africa. We take it for granted. We think it is enough to say that, okay, um, why don't you want to take the vaccine? Because I mean, the, the people that you claim want to kill us are the same people who are producing the, mas the, the vaccines for measles, the vaccines for paracetamol, the vaccines for the malaria, uh, sorry, the, the producing the malaria drugs. But what they forget is that Nobody is going around convincing people to take malaria drugs. Nobody is convincing people to go and get the jabs for measles. This is a special case. And because of the urgency of the situation, there are campaigns going on urging people to get the job. But people need to understand why they need to get the job. And we need to also find a way to break the science for them to understand what really happens when 
the vaccine gets into their, their system. And I think all these are issues that we have overlooked. And these are the issues that my reporting, thanks once again to the Pulitzer Center, uncovered. And now you see that a lot of the countries, especially in Sierra Leone and in Ghana, the two-way communication is taking place and the vaccination uptake is improving. And so, yes, that's that's essentially what, what my reporting has uncovered. And I look forward to going to one of the countries that, um, you know, have achieved the 70% mark. And so going to a place like Rwanda to also see what is really, you know, happening and why, you know, the, the vaccination rates are encouraging and all of that. That would be the next step to take. But um, yeah, I think that will be it for, for now. Thank you. Thanks very much, Agan. That was really valuable. I learned a lesson from you that we can't just assume what uh, the needs are, that we as journalists can help scientists and policymakers become aware of what are the questions that people have in a local community, and in essence, what, are, what is the information that they need, and your story clearly did that. Before we moving on to Taiwo, I just want to read a few comments that you guys have made. Um, we have a comment from Catherine who says, uh, um, Angela's story is a great example of responsive journalism, listening to community needs and providing life-saving info. And I think we can say the same of Ridwan's story. And then Susan Ferris of the Pulitzer Center said it's an excellent point about following the story, Angela, in response to your story, of course. And Agan Daniel from Mesha, the media organization, the science media organization in Kenya, um, re-emphasized and he said, yes, the messenger is the message. Um, that's well said. And Suren or Susan also made another comment, reporting in communities up close is essential to understand barriers that Ridwan is talking about. And just a quick reminder again that Ridwan mentioned his fellowship or his grant that he received and Susan is at the end of this event going to explain to you guys, if you'd like, if you're a journalist and you'd like to apply for a grant, how to do that. Let's move on to Taiwo and hear about his story. Taiwo, Taiwo over to you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm gonna speak on my story. Uh, my story is basically on uh, why some residents of uh, some coastal villages uh, in Nigeria refused to take the COVID-19 vaccine. I particularly came about this story when I had a conversation with uh, a cousin of mine who lives around the coastal uh, villages. So, and he told me that so many of the fishermen were not ready to take the vaccine. I asked him why, and I talked about the kind of misinformation that was going on. And the one that uh, particularly fascinated me was the issue of infertility. So I asked him why uh, they felt uh, it would make them become um, important. And they said that was what they had. Because in such communities, uh, they, they took it quite serious because they, they prize having a lot of children. In most fishing communities, uh, children are quite instrumental to the business of the day because they help their parents uh, during the fishing expedition and they help their parents to smoke the fishes. So uh, uh, the, 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 if you have a lot of children, that means you're going to have um, a big business, a big efficient business. So the price having a lot of children like 10, 15 to 20 just for one month. So uh, when he told me about the story, um, I said, I just have to visit and talk to this fish. I mean, why they feel that uh, COVID-19 vaccine could cause infertility. So uh, while I was uh, uh, in those uh, fishing villages, I realized that uh, they didn't really believe that COVID-19 uh, COVID was real. Uh, and if they at least believed, they, they thought it was um, malaria blown out of proportion. And again, they felt it was um, a disease for the rich. A disease that was, was uh, partic uh, particularly in, let me say, cities, and it would take time before it gets to the coastal villages around the Pacific, uh, around the Atlantic Ocean. So they never believed it would, and the, 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 the infection rate was quite low practically because people were not uh, going out to get tested. So they felt, why should we take the COVID-19 vaccine? So in, in some of those communities, I realized that there were uh, clinics that had enough vaccines. 
they have boxes of vac vaccines. They would wait, uh, the officials would, would wait from morning to evening. Uh, just sometimes they, they, wouldn't, they, they wouldn't see even a resident coming for uh, the vaccine. Sometimes just two in a week, sometimes two in two weeks. So they just sit there with the vaccines. When it is evening, they pack the vaccines and they go back to sleep. Now, one thing I realized about the story was the fact that when uh, the, uh, the, the officials, the health officials realized that the people were not taking the vaccine. So they looked at the issue of infertility and how it affects them because they, they think they need to be potent enough to have enough children for their businesses. So they felt, okay, how do we convince these people to take the COVID-19 vaccine? So they started a community outreach. They had some health officials that they recruited and they called them community mobilizers. So they could speak the language of the people. So they were children that they knew right from childbirth that could convince them. So they, they, they had to go from house to house to convince the fishermen about the, 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 how good the vaccine is, the, the products using the vaccine and how it will not affect them. Then most of the time they also go to the seashore. So whenever the fishermen come back from DC, they meet them immediately and try to talk to them one-on-one -on -one and tell them why they need to take the vaccine. But for me, the, the most important tool that they used in convincing most of the fishermen was the fact that they had to vaccinate most of their traditional and religious leaders. So they took out their, uh, they, they, they explained or they, they convinced their traditional and um, religious leaders to take the vaccine. So maybe those who took the vaccines, they were able to go into the houses of the fishermen. They were able to go to the seashore to convince the fishermen why they needed to take the vaccine, despite the fact that the infection rate was low, despite the fact that they've not physically seen people uh, that, that died uh, due to complications from COVID-19. So uh, that, that made uh, the, the the vaccination rate increased from practically 5% to 30% within that period. So basically, my story is like an expository piece for people to understand why those set of people refused vehemently to take the COVID-19 because they felt it would destroy their lineage. They felt it was, it was an agenda from the West to make them stop producing children or to reduce the population of Africans. Thank you. Thanks very much, Taibo, and thank you for pointing out again, for re-emphasizing that we need to speak to people as journalists to find out and help policymakers why people have fears, that we can't just assume um, we know or why they wouldn't um, want to take a vaccine. And thank you for your story that did such a, a great job. For those of you who would like to read the stories that our panelists mentioned, we've entered them in the chat box. All three stories that they've spoken about is in there. We now are going to move on to our Q&A session, but just before that, Sandy Ndonia, who's a media trainer from Kenya, has made an interesting comment saying, the distrust and hesitation around vaccines lingers on to date in Kenya and the rest of Africa. And it is important for us as the media to carefully listen to the reasons and concerns people have in order to help us effectively use evidence to keep busting myths and mis- and disinformation, especially in religious and political communities or in relation to that. Thank you for that comment, Sandy. And I think that just again re-emphasizes and breaks down what has happened in many of these stories that we heard about today. Susan Ferris also said Taiwan's story also showed how valuable it is to report in communities to document to document barriers and also local solutions that have worked to get past those barriers. Medical workers globally can learn a lot from these stories. Thanks for that comment, Susan. We're now going to move on to questions. If you still have a burning question, please do enter it in the chat box. I'm going to move to one question we received from Tiffany Jackson Zunker, who is the Deputy Director of Africa Regional Media Hub in the US Department of State. She points out that misinformation can be prolific during a pandemic, 
especially because many reporters essentially become health reporters overnight without the training because things happen so quickly. Now, she says that is one aspect, but another dynamic that plays out is that there's disinformation. So the difference between misinformation and disinformation is often that this information is deliberate. And the results um, might look the same, but they are very different, she says. And she wants our panelists to address, can you talk about the role of this information within the context of this discussion and how can the media combat that? Angela, I'm going to ask you to respond to this question. Thank you so much, Mia. Um, to respond to the uh, doctor's question, um, Actually, when we are talking about misinformation and disinformation when it comes to vaccine and medicine at large, uh, how do we make people like, uh, how do we make it right for them on all the disinformation and misinformation that they are getting? One thing that I, I normally uh, use when it comes to such, such kind of uh, 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 scenarios, you know, science never lies. And one of the aspects that you, if you are a very keen health reporter, then you have to use the evidence-based uh, uh, kind of reporting. If there's something that someone, for instance, if someone is saying that um, uh, COVID-19 causes uh, uh, infertility, how true or how untrue is this? What is the science behind it? What are some of the journals? What are some of the articles? What are some of the reviewed articles that have been done on this? And what do we really have data when it comes to such? In what context can we put in as a journalist to actually tell you that indeed it's true or it's not true? I will use data. First of all, I encourage people. One of the aspects that we, we normally do or we should do as a journalist, when, I'm, when something like new vaccine comes up, I shouldn't encourage you to take the vaccine. I will not do that. I will use my information. I will use science. I will use data to encourage you to take the vaccine. One thing. What is the uh, what are scientists saying about the vaccine? What are some of the uh, papers that have been done in regards to what we are talking about? In what context? What is data saying about it? So you use an evidence-based uh, kind of approach to answer that. But as a journalist, that is my work to convince you so that you know that this is the truth of the matter and it's not like that. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, That's I a great. Can I add just a, sorry, sorry, let me just add a little bit to that. I also think that instead of looking at it as like a, a war between those who are spreading the disinformation and the misinformation, like between us and them, we should rather make them our allies. And, 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 and by, by that, what I mean is that a lot of the disinformation and the misinformation that we, we have seen about the vaccines across the continent are coming from pastors, religious leaders, and politicians. Why is it that prior to even our vaccination campaigns, why don't we bring them on board? You know, make them part of the planning so that they are part of the process. For instance, in Ghana, the Christian council is there. That is, you know, it oversees all the churches. If they are part of the, you know, what will go into the vaccination campaign, they communicate it to their members. And the pastors themselves will stand in the churches and tell their members to go for you know, the vaccines. But when they are completely left out, then they peddle all sorts of things. So I think that instead of seeing them as you know, enemies and stuff, look, we should find a way to, to, to make them part of what we are doing. We should make them our allies. Thank you. Thanks, Ritwan. That's a very valuable point, to be inclusive and get allies rather than enemies. Daiwo, did you want to say anything on this point? Oh, uh, not really. I do not have any contribution on that. Sorry, Tao, I couldn't hear you clearly, but I, I assume you said not right now. So let's move on to the next question. And that would be from Mary Mawendwa from Kenya. She asks, what are your thoughts in terms of investigative journalism around COVID-19? For instance, the scandals where money was misappropriated. Tabu, can we start off with you? Have you done any stories that investigated 
those sort of issues? And do you think it's necessary and as important as breaking down the science? Uh, for me, yes, I think uh, investigative journalism is very important uh, in uncovering um, uh, irregularities around uh, the COVID-19 vaccine. Now, when let, let me give an example of uh, a story I did uh, when the COVID-19 um, thing just started in Nigeria. Uh, when the COVID-19 infection uh, uh, began, there was, we have about 36 states in Nigeria, but there was just one state that claimed that they had no infection of COVID-19. Out of the 36 states, just one state. So I traveled, I, I traveled uh, down to the states uh, through the many uh, roadblocks and all that because uh, there were no flights and all that. So I spent about six days to that particular state. So when I got to that particular state, I realized that uh, the governor actually stopped the people from taking the test, COVID-19 test. And another day I realized that those who had the test, they would cover up their results. So I got there and I, uh, when I got to the teaching hospital, I asked them to test me. It took about 10 hours for an official to come out. So when they eventually came out, I waited for about two weeks before I wrote my story, I never got my results. In fact, a month, I think I waited for about uh, a, month, a month or let me say about six weeks, and my results never came out. So that particular story actually uncovered how the state can actually suppress the information that people need on COVID-19. They stop the people from uh, uh, getting tested. They, they suppress every information around the vaccine. And if you get tested, they wouldn't give you your results. So they just wanted to spread this kind of information about the COVID-19 that it wasn't as bad as it was. Meanwhile, the people were dying. Some of the doctors were dying in the part, uh, in that particular state. So it got to a particular point in time that the doctors went on strike because they were dying from complications that were related to COVID-19. So my story actually exposed what was happening in the state. And in a few weeks, the federal government looked into that issue and in about a week, they discovered about five or six COVID-19 cases in that particular state. So that is what investigative journalism can do to expose a lot of irregularities or fraud around COVID-19 vaccine or uh, the COVID-19 disease itself. Thanks, Tabo. I'm going to move on to the next question because we're reaching the end of our um, event, we're getting close to that. Joan van Dijk of Bikasisa asks Angela, how did you know your story led to more vaccinations? How did you track that? Um, thank you so much, Joan. And um, actually the Ministry of Health have, uh, they have like a, a, a how they collect their data. There's the aspect of the, them grouping how uh, the people who are coming in for the vaccine, which they don't put in, uh, they don't give the public the access to have those informations. But then I, I, I was privileged to have a friend at the center who where all these informations were being recorded. But then after the story, because it's, he was one of the doctors that are quoted in the story, and then I really wanted to know how uh, the story, the impact the story had after it was published. So I had to go through him again to get the data uh, before and after. And uh, clearly after the story, mm -hmm. it, uh, Prove that there was some uh, uh, numbers that increased uh, when it comes to uh, expectant women who are getting the vaccination. So they have to group them. There's the, the, the teenagers, the, the expectant mothers, the elderly, the children. So you get to know at what point did you do the story? What was the number? And when the story was published after, what is the number? So you can easily tell. And uh, I can say that uh, it had an impact because by that time, that is the story that train when it comes to expectant women and vaccine in the country. So that's how I knew that my story had an impact. Thanks. Thanks, Angela. That's a very great, clear explanation of how you knew about the impact. I'm going to end with a question of Tim Franz from Unite Health Awards. And I'm going to ask Redwan to respond to that. Tim is asking, how important is the connection between mass media and that would be newspapers or broadcasters and health related discussions on social media today? Is working as a health journalist closely linked to using social media for listening from now on? Red one. 
Absolutely. I think now all the platforms, whether radio, whether TV or newspaper, have realized that they can't do without social media because that's where a lot of the young people are. And so they are constantly finding innovative ways, you know, to communicate the stories on social media because how you communicate social, sorry, how you communicate stories on TV, on radio, news, on the, sorry, in the newspaper, you can't use the same format, you know? So people are using a lot of, you know, innovative ways. And we are seeing a lot of health reporters in Africa who are using infographics, they are using, um, you know, short videos, you know, like uh, myth busters and all of that to, to, to send the message across to the people. But what I have realized is that I think largely health reporting in Africa doesn't look at the medical side. A lot of, a lot of journalists lack understanding in terms of exploring the medical side of things. And so usually we are looking at, you know, the social aspect of it, which is important. I mean, the social determinants of health are crucial. But I also think that we need a lot of capacity in understanding the medical side of issues and how to break them down on social media. Because a lot of the time, we, we, we put the technologies and everything on social media. But as a health reporter, as a journalist, understanding social media content and how to communicate on social media is extremely important. Thanks, Ridwan. And just a thought on that, the Reuters Institute for the Advancements of Journalism at Oxford University, in their annual latest digital media report, um, they stated that the fastest growing source for access to specifically news, so not just general information news, is TikTok in South Africa, Kenya, and Nigeria for people between 18 and 36. So definitely, um, social media, like you've pointed out, is a very important channel and platform for accessing news today. And it's important that then we have the skills to, uh, to bring across information in the format that that platform requires. We're reaching the end of our event, but before we end, can Susan Ferris of the Pulitzer Center Please tell us more about your fellowships or your grants that you have at the center. Susan is a senior editor at the Pulitzer Center, and it is her program who made it possible for Ridwan and for Taiwo to do their stories. And you, as a journalist who's joining this event, can apply for such a grant too. Susan? Hello, everyone. Um, I'm so pleased to see so many people here uh, interested in this. And um, thank you so much, Mia, and everyone else at uh, the center for helping us with this and setting this up. It's uh, really been very interesting. And, and again, I'm so pleased that so many people are interested. The Pulitzer Center supports reporters in the United States and globally so that they can pursue stories they might not be able to afford to do. If um, I'd like you to go to our website, pulitzercenter.org, and you could go to our grants, our grant page on COVID-19 and public health inequities globally. Um, and you can learn more about an opportunity for health reporting. Um, I think uh, Ridwan and Taiwo's stories are very good examples of what we can provide. Uh, often we you you must apply. Uh, it, this application is open to newsrooms and to um, freelancers. Uh, we do ask that you have a relationship in some way, like a, some interest from an outlet in your story. Um, we ask that you pursue stories that are enterprise stories, untold stories. Um, and what we can provide is money to, for you to travel, perhaps to hire uh, a photographer when you're on site. We ask that you do some pre-reporting so you know that you, you have a story. Um, again, I think their stories are good examples where you see that there's been some pre-reporting. They know that they're going to find something important where they're planning to travel. And um, and so this can be very crucial to, to newsrooms everywhere who can't afford to send 
correspondents and, and uh, reporters to pursue these types of stories. We're interested in inequities, systemic inequities in your countries or others you might want to go to. And um, we're interested in, in vaccine, cri the vaccine crisis, people not trusting vaccines, barriers. Uh, we've had uh, supported a lot of reporting on um, uh, the need for um, regional development of vaccines so that the global south is not dependent on the north. Um, we've supported stories on maternal mortality, which is worse now in many countries, not only because of COVID, but also because of uh, neglect, systemic neglect, um, other other uh, illnesses that women can develop during pregnancy that aren't getting adequately treated. Um, we're interested in you know the fall of childhood vaccinations. So um, take a look at our website, please, and you read carefully how you might apply. And if you do have questions, you can email me, and I'd be happy to address what I can. Thanks very much, Susan. And for those of you who haven't been able to find the link to, that Susan mentioned, it's in the chat box. We've entered it there. It's directly to the grants or the fellowships on the Pulitzer, Pulitzer Center site. And I'm going to ask our technical team to please also enter Susan's email address on the chat in the chat box in case people want to email her with questions. Now that brings us to the end of today's event. We will be emailing everyone, all of you who registered for this event, we will be emailing you a recording of the event tomorrow. And that email will also include a short survey to find out more what you thought of today's event. And we'll really appreciate it if you fill it out so that we know if there's something that can, we can do better, that we do that in the next event, or if there's something that worked really well, that we can make sure we also include that in a future event. That's it from me, Mia, Milan in South Africa. Thank you very much for joining our webinar today and have a lovely rest of your day. Goodbye. <laughs>